For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. This season, let us celebrate the arrival of our Savior, the King of Kings, Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, Jesus. This morning, as is mentioned, we are in a Christmas series um, that really focuses on the arrival of Jesus. I think that's appropriate because that's what happened at Christmas, right? The arrival of Jesus. Um, But if you have a Bible, I'd like to ask you to take it out, be it an analog version or a digital version, and to find yourself in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. This morning we step into the second installment of our four-part series entitled Christmas at Coastline. And as was mentioned by Pastor John, we're, we're kind of taking these first three Sundays of the month Well, to really prepare our hearts. You know, I I like Christmas at Coastline. And uh, even, you know, for this week, as was mentioned, Jesus brought the cold back. If you were like (laughs) somewhere in the afternoon inside and you walked outside in the evening, you're like, well, there it is. There's Northwest Florida for you. Um, But this Wednesday, as was mentioned, cookies in the courtyard. This Thursday, we'll have 100 kids in here or so for our Coastline Academy Christmas production. Uh, This weekend, there'll be a recording that's going to happen with all the kids and the adults that are participating in the Christmas Eve service. There's a Friday night Christmas party for the students, and then next week on Friday at 3 and 5, I can't believe it's already here, but we'll have a Christmas Eve gathering. We'll have candlelight for those that are responsible and uh, glow sticks for those that aren't. That's kind of the way we communicate that. I've got a lot of aunts in my tribe with six kids, so we got to have glow sticks, you know. But um, it really will be a special time to gather, and whether it's, it's in the room on campus or it's online in another room, we are, we're seeking to be as intentional as we can this Christmas season to make much of Jesus. Um, so I hope you'll join us for, for this Sunday. Obviously, you made it. You're here. Good job. But next Sunday, then also into Christmas Eve. And, um, you know, as was mentioned, we're taking these Sundays to focus on, even though we're not necessarily calling it this, but we're focusing on the advent of Jesus. And you may say, why do I use that word? What does that mean? A lot of our brothers and sisters who've gathered in, in gatherings such as these for hundreds and hundreds of years have taken that month of December to be focused, to be intentional, to to make room, as it were, in their schedules, in their families, for the advent of Jesus. Say, why do you keep using that word? What does it mean? It's a Latin word. Unless you go to classical conversations and you're a homeschool kid and that stream of thought, Latin's not a part of your day-to-day. So you say, well, what does that mean? Latin just simply means the arrival, or the coming. And as I spent some time thinking and preparing for our time together this morning, you know, I think it's really true that there's actually three advents of Jesus. So what do you mean by that? We're very familiar with the first advent. Jesus came 2,000 years ago. He, he He had a forerunner, like this massive PR program called the Bible, like for thousands of years, they were preparing for him. And then he came, lit up the night with angels. Jesus came. It's a historical fact. It doesn't really matter whether or not you believe, in my opinion, that it happened. It happened. Now, it does matter to me whether or not you believe in Jesus. Oh, that matters tremendously for your saving faith. But whether or not you disagree or agree with history, well, you know, do your research. Jesus was a historical real figure who actually existed and actually is attested to rising from the dead, not just from biblical authors, but from even secular. That's real. That's not fake news. That's the facts. Jesus came. That's the first advent. And we're familiar somewhat with the the second advent. If you're following along with us in our Daily in the Word program, our little devotional, Monday through Friday, we're going through the book of Revelation. 
And it reveals to us more of who Jesus is. And part of who Jesus is, is he's just. He's king. And in his first advent, he came as a humble servant, a baby, to seek and save the lost. Anyone thankful for that, that Jesus came? Yeah, super thankful. But also Jesus is coming again. This second advent we're familiar with. The first is past, maybe the second is future. He's not coming as a babe. He's coming as a righteous judge. Read the book of Revelation. But you know, there's a third advent. Well, what do you mean by that? There's past, there's future, and there's present. Now. Now. Jesus wants to come into whatever's going on now. Why? To judge as a baby? Which one is it? Well, Jesus is our hope. He's our joy. He's our peace. It's found nowhere else. And in these three Sundays before Christmas, we're preparing our hearts for the real meaning of Christmas. Today it's joy. In Luke chapter 2, verse 10, the angel said, I bring you so-so news. No. Nope. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to some people, to all people. What joy was spoken of by the angels on the night of Jesus' birth? The best commentary on the Bible is, do you know the answer to that? The Bible. The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, the author writes this, Because of the joy awaiting him, he, speaking of Jesus, endured the cross, disregarding its shame. It was shameful to be crucified. There were no like tiled, beautiful crosses and gatherings when Jesus got together. These are wooden apparatuses on the side of the road where criminals hung naked and were ashamed. Luke chapter 2, verse 10 I bring you good news that will bring great joy. What is the great joy? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Because of the joy awaiting him. What, what is it? Well, if you read Luke 2, 10 in its entirety, in its context, the angels say, don't be afraid. I bring you that good news that will bring great joy. It's the Savior. Yes, the Messiah, the Lord. He has been born this day in Bethlehem, the city of David. Jesus is the promised and the anointed one, and he came to save. He came to save. See, listen to me. Let me see your eyes. Your greatest need in life is not more money. It's not a better reputation. It's not to finally get into that situation where you feel like the dust settles in life. Your greatest need in life is a savior. If it was a leadership coach, that's what God would have sent. If it was a financial advisor, that's what he would have sent. But Jesus sent a Savior. God sent a Savior in his son Jesus. It's our greatest need. To be reconciled with the one who created us. For first and foremost, we are spiritual beings. So God so loved the world that he gave his son. And he endured the horror of the cross. Why? Because he knew that through the cross, there would be a redeemed people, that they would be birthed. This is Advent. This is the arrival. This is the coming of a Savior. But the present Advent, here and now, Romans chapter 14, verse 17 says this, the kingdom of God It's not eating or drinking. It's not about superficial lists of do's and don'ts. The kingdom of God, listen to this, is living a life of goodness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So how do you know if Jesus is really welcomed in your present? Well, there's a litmus test. Let me see your life. Is there goodness? Is there peace? Is there joy? If not, then where's Jesus? Because that's what he brings. That's the kingdom of his domain. In your life right now, here's the beautiful thing. God has given a gift of joy through his son Jesus. The lifestyle of a believer, like Romans chapter 14, verse 17 says, is living a life of goodness, 
and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. This is the beauty of joy for here and now for you and me. He's given you joy. You got to let that sink in for a second. He's given you joy. You don't have to muster it up. You don't have to go find it. You don't have to go look for it. It's not on a price tag. It's not in an accolade. It's not in an accomplishment. He's given you joy. He births it supernaturally. Check out Galatians 5.22 if you want to find out more. Joy, it's a beautiful thing. It's both a gift and a command. Philippians chapter 4, we'll see that momentarily. And this morning, we're going to learn from a familiar text, Philippians chapter 4. You know, if you were with us in the fall of this year, we went through a teaching series called Jesus is the Key to Joy. Yeah, we walked through those four chapters of Philippians. Beautiful book, the book of Philippians. I actually wasn't here the Sunday that the church walked through Philippians chapter 4 and the verses that we're going to look at this morning. And as I began thinking and praying and preparing for this topic this morning, it became ever so clear to me. Joy is both a gift and it's a calling. It's a command. But I want to have an opportunity for joy to have it stay. It seems so elusive sometimes. It's like you get like, like you're underwater and you're catching your breath, like, ah, oh, I got joy, going back into whatever. I want to have it stay. There's thieves to joy. You remember these two? Maybe you can name these two individuals right here. You know these guys? <laughs> Does anyone know their names? Marv and Harry. It's not, it's not going to be on the test to get into heaven. It's okay. You don't have to know those names. It's just like a cultural thing. You know they like remade Home Alone, kind of like a British version, some style. I don't know if you've seen that on Disney+. Plus. My kids weren't stoked. But anyway, thieves. Did you know that there's actually thieves to joy? This morning, we're going to look at two of them. Here they are. Today, we'll consider these two thieves, worry and wishes. Worry and wishes. They're thieves to joy. And this morning, if I were to entitle our time together, this is what I would call the next half hour that we've got together. Simply this. Joy is a gift given. Don't let it go. Joy is a gift that has been given to you. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to muster it up. You don't have to go look for it. It's given. Don't let it go. This morning, we'll be in Philippians chapter 4, and I'm an alliterator, so, you know, we'll look at the problems, the principles, the promises from Philippians chapter 4, but ultimately, this reveals the power that is available to us to live a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. This morning in Philippians 4, problems, principles, promises, and power. Father, I pray as we have an opportunity to look into your word together that I would serve your people well. Help me to focus, Lord. Help me to um, to share what you would want to say. And I pray for your precious people, Lord, that we would be here to listen and learn from the Spirit of God, and that God, by your Spirit, you would lead your people to a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Pray that you'd bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4, 5, 6, and 7, reading from the New Living Translation. Listen to what Paul writes to an early church in the life of church history that he, he deeply loved. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let everyone see that you're considerate in all you do. And remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. And thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, 
which exceeds anything we can understand, is peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Verses 4 and 5, we see this command given to what? Starts with a J, ends with a Y. Joy. It's this command. It's this dynamic of, hey, listen, wake up, pay attention. If, I don't think Paul said this, but I say this. Let me see your eyes, right? It's kind of like what he's saying. Rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to tell you again. Rejoice. How? In the Lord. Focused on the Lord. By His Spirit. Why? Because it's so easy to look every other place and to live in so many other worlds, isn't it? But as a Christian, you're in Him. See, here's the problem. The thief of joy found in verse 6. Worry, anxiety, and a lifestyle that's dominated by fear. This is a thief. Worry is a wrecker. If we had more time together, I I read a book recently on some of the statistical analysis that's been done of American teenagers since the pandemic and COVID and how it has increased exponentially the rate of teen suicide, the need for prescriptions for anxiety and depression. It's a real thing. I don't think we have to belabor that point. I think that's a known reality for most of us. Worry kills our joy, destroys our trust in God. And here's the other unfortunate dynamic about worry. It steals time from you that you will never get back. It steals from you. He's a thief. John 10.10, Jesus said, The enemy, the thief, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have a so-so life. Life abundant. What does that mean? Fat pockets? Like, I'm going to get everything I want under that tree? It's a life of goodness. A life of peace. A life of joy. Through trials and tribulations. Not from them. In the world, you will experience hardship. Trouble. Trial. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I'm not quoting Neil. I'm quoting Jesus. That's what he said. In the world, expect it. Don't let it like knock you off on your heels. I can't believe t- stuff is tough. I can't believe people are hard to deal with. This is crazy. I-, I just thought everything was roses and rainbows in this world. No. To quote Rocky Balboa, right? The world is a nasty place. It's mean. No one will hit harder than life, right? There's a lot of truth in that. But be of good cheer. Jesus is better than Rocky. We can make a t-shirt. Jesus is greater. Anyway, I'm digressing. One author, Max Lucado, says this. The German word for worry means to strangle. The Greek word means to divide the mind. And both are accurate. Worry is a noose on the neck and a distraction of the mind. And neither are befitting of joy. That's true. If we had more time together, I would love to read the words of Jesus on worry. But I want to give them to you. If you're like, man, I want to see what Jesus has to say. Who cares about this character, Neil? Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34. I'd encourage you to spend some time there. So much much there. Where Jesus says, I tell you not to worry. I firmly believe that God's commandments are God's enablements. If he's called us to do something, he will enable us to do it. Worry brings nothing but takes everything. And this isn't the life that God intends in Advent for us. So what does God do? As a good father in Philippians chapter 4, with the backdrop of what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 26, God gives us a principle to live by. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6, if you're there, let me know by saying, Jesus is joy. joy. Listen to what he says in verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. What's he saying here? He's saying at least two things. Number one's perspective, and number two is prayer. Here's the perspective. Don't let your mind be strangled. Don't let your mind be divided, concerned, uneasy, restless, and worried. He doesn't say, work yourself up to the place where you can do this. 
He says, I want you to do this. Not something you work to do. It's like eating or teething. I have a little girl in my life right now named Lainey Louise Pearl, and you don't want to get close to her if you have a knuckle or any kind of fabric because she's teething. And you don't have to tell her, hey, if, you're, if your gums are hurting, latch onto something and gnaw it to death. It'll help you feel better. She knows. And if you get near her, those are some power. Those are like the jaws of life, you know, like just go, Glah. she knows. She knows what to do. You don't have to teach her to do it. Paul commands his readers not to be anxious about anything. The fact that Paul commands the Philippians not to be anxious indicates that it is something that they have, listen to these words carefully, please, an element of control. Am I saying there's no validity whatsoever to anyone that struggles with depression or anxiety? Absolutely not. We have a brain that is physical, that can have chemical imbalances, totally. And I was talking to a guy today who, was a, who boxed a lot and like his finger has this issue, he had this wrist issue, like, hey, he boxed a lot, so he's got to fix that, like, right? Like, I think boxing is great, but maybe Jesus, I don't know, like, I don't know, anyway. I don't know if it's like what we were supposed to do with our hands all the time, that's why it's hurting, right? We live in a physical world where everything is broken, so please listen to this. I'm not saying there's no validity to the dynamic that you may need to see a counselor or that you may need some sort of element of support. But hear me on this. Hear me on this. To not be anxious from Scripture for a Christian who's in the Lord communicates that there's some element of participatory control. Some element. Now, whatever that element is, I don't know. It's each his own in that situation. But Paul says this. Get this perspective. Nothing is worth your worry. Now, there is a difference between panic, anxiety, and a healthy fear. I have a healthy fear of sharks, and I feel like that's okay. Like if a shark shows up, and I'm at the beach, like, hey, that's a healthy fear. I'm not going near that thing. There is a difference between a healthy fear of something and anxiety that divides the mind and strangles the mind. Do you understand the difference there? There is definitely a dynamic of difference in play. But this is what he's saying. Please hear this. God is in control. He sees you. He is bigger than your mistakes. Listen. Learn from the past, but don't live there. Live now. Now. The advent of Jesus in the present is to lead you, Romans 14, 17, in a life of goodness, peace, and joy. That's the life that's been bought for you. Fight for it. God is in control. So he starts to talk about prayer. And he doesn't just say this, just, you know, do the rosary, just do something. No, he doesn't. He gives a lot of clarity to prayer. He says, I want you to pray with supplication. What does that mean? You know who understands supplication? Leonidas Ulysses Spencer. He has discovered Frosty the Snowman in this season on YouTube, and it is on repeat daily. This is what he says to me. Dad, Frosty, on the couch, blanket, I need my cup. Like, he's very specific, <laughs> and, he, and he knows exactly what he wants, and he is not letting you go until Frosty comes on, he has his cup, and he has his blanket, And he's sitting there, and he only drinks water. Thank God for that. He doesn't even like juice. That's a wonderful man. But I love that about him. But this is what it is. Supplication means to ask earnestly, specifically, and humbly. Now, he needs to work on that, Leo does. But but this is the dynamic. Supplication doesn't mean this. God, if if you're not too busy, you know, here I am, and I'm struggling with something. That's not the heart of David in the book of Psalms. You ever read Psalm 5? And it's, I mean, maybe not in its original language, but the language of that is there. God, here I am. Where are you? Wake up. Hello, here I am. That's what David is saying. Because I feel forgotten about you. David is honest. But there's humility in the language of prayer of the psalmist David. He says, I want you to pray with supplication specifically. But he says, I want you to do it with thanksgiving. Do you remember that message from just a couple weeks ago on gratitude? 
that gratitude is the soil of the heart that only joy and peace and goodness can grow in. If you're not a grateful person, listen to me, by God's Spirit, you can own that quality. You can. Start counting your blessings. Be grateful. One person once shared with me that the key to defeating depression is gratefulness and specificity. Happiness is not getting what you want, but wanting what you have. And he says, let your request be made known to God. Speak honestly to God. God knows what you're thinking anyway. Psalm 51, verse 17, the psalmist writes, the sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite spirit. God, I'm coming before you, hope open and honest. What's the principle that he's saying here? Do you navigate worry? Well, yeah, it's a problem. I recognize that. Is there an element of obedience that's required with worry? I'd say there is. Your struggle and threshold may be different with it if if that's the dynamic that you're navigating, but there's still this dynamic. There is a dynamic of obedience related to worry. And what is it? Well, here's the first principle. Come to God. That's the first person. Before I talk to anyone else about my problem, I want to talk to him. I come to God, and what do I do? I pray specifically, eagerly, thankfully, and honestly. God, I'm coming before you. This is a principle in Scripture. What's the promise? Look at verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God is not for sale. And it doesn't come from understanding. But like a fullback protects his quarterback. Is that the job of a fullback? I've never played football. Someone once told me. Nobody else knows. We'll just pretend that it is. But like, no, this guy says no. Like somebody on the team that's supposed to protect the quarterback, that's what the peace of God is supposed to do with your heart. Like a soldier guarding its post. That's more the term. It's not an athletic term. It's more of a militaristic term. But it's speaking actually of to protect by garrison. Did you know that if you were guarding a prisoner as a Roman soldier and they somehow escaped your care, you were now guilty of their transgression and now you would take upon yourself the penalty for their crime. So you better believe that the garrison that guarded whoever it was was focused, was paying attention, was very militant about their guarding. And this is what God says through his word. The peace of God, like that garrison who's guarding, will guard your heart and mind. Here's the simple principle. Here's the simple promise. Worry, he's coming for you whether you're ready or not. What are you going to do? Here's a principle. Come to God in prayer. How? Specifically, eagerly, thankfully, and honestly. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. If worry were a rock, then this is the water that will wear it. Specifically, eagerly, thankfully, honestly. The peace of God will guard your heart as you spend time with the one who created you. But worry is so nasty, isn't it? That he gives you a second principle of how to deal with it here. It's found in verse 8. He says, finally, brethren... Whatever things of character of truth, things that are worthy of reverence, things that are righteous, things that are pure, whatever things are lovely, attractive, excellence, if there be fit of an object of praise, these things make the subject of careful reflection. Think about these kinds of things consistently, thoroughly, daily. You've heard it said before, physically you are what you eat, and spiritually you are what you think. What you think on can determine how you act and respond. You know this. Outlook often determines outcome. So here's what the Bible tells you. Is it true? Is it honest? Is it just? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it of good report? Does it have virtue? Is there something praiseworthy there? If not, then 2 Corinthians 10.5, that thought. What does that mean? Bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. 
This is where the battle is fought most often. Think of those eight qualities as a sieve for the thoughts of your mind. And as you're thinking, go, okay, is what I'm thinking true? Is it lovely? Is there good report here? If not, I'm free from it. I don't have to think about this. I'm letting this go. Think accurately. But don't stop there. Let thinking accurately translate into taking action. Look at verse 9. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me saw doing, then the God of peace will be with you. What is this saying? What is the principle here? It's very simple. Think accurately and take action. Think accurately and take action. When you don't know what to do, do what you know to do. Be kind to your wife. Forgive the one who's offended you. Give to those in need. Be thankful for what God has given you. Give to others. You know to do that. It's in God's word. When you don't know what to do, do, know what, you, do what you know to do. What is the principle here? He says, listen, are you, are you struggling with worry? Are you thinking accurately and are you taking action? Well, no. Well, look at what happens. As it says there in verse 9, if you'll simply obey the Lord and walk with him by the power of his spirit, the God of peace will be with you. Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 17, happy are you if you listen to sermons. No. You know what Jesus said in John 13, 17? Happy are you if you do the things that I've commanded you. Knowledge and wisdom are two different things. Knowledge is the accumulation of facts and figures and information. Wisdom is the application, and the literal meaning of the word is skillful living. That's the goal. I want to live skillfully. Apply what the Word of God says. God has not called us to be men and women who come and study the Bible. God has called us to be disciples who learn the Word of God so that we can live the Word of God. That's the purpose of it. If you know all these truths, but you don't live them, how do they benefit you? One of my mentors once said, Neil, it is not about how many books you've read. It's how well you've read the books you have. Are you living the truths that you've taken in? The promise is that the God of peace will be with you. So that first thief of joy, the problem, we'll call him Marv, right? This is Marv. Marv is worry, anxiety, fear. And it steals, kills, and destroys. What's the principle and promise found in verse 6 and 7 of Philippians chapter 4? Here's the principle. Don't miss this. I hope you catch this. It's not going to be up on the screen, but I hope you get this. It's in the Bible, so that's good. Come to God in prayer. How? Specifically, eagerly, thankfully, honestly. The promise? The peace of God will guard your heart. But since worry is so just gnarly, he gives a second principle. Verses 8 and 9. Think accurately and take action appropriately, and the God of peace will be with you. Worry is a thief. He doesn't have to be. God loves you so much that he's given you principles and promises in his word and the power of his spirit to see it through. And here's the thing. Please don't miss this. You hear me say this so often. He's given you a community to live in. No one ever gets healthy alone. You must be, in my opinion, to be a resilient disciple, one who can navigate what's coming for us, gathering with God's people to love and worship him, and grouping with God's people to connect and build real community. If those aren't habits of your life as a believer, you'll just kind of be everywhere all the time. You'll just be that guy that when people say, yeah, what are you into now? You don't want to be that guy. You want to move forward. The community of God with you supports you so greatly in your walk with Jesus. 
See, here's the deal. How do you deal with the problem of worry? Well, there's principles and promises, but there's another thief. Wishes. That's the only one we'll look at this morning. We only have a handful of minutes more. But how, how, would, we, how would we describe this? Always wanting what you don't have, right? A wish. If the enemy can have us focus on what we don't have, we'll miss out on what we do have. One of the things I both love and loathe about social media is the memories feature. Are, are you familiar with this feature? It was like, two years ago, you were much skinnier than you are now, is what it seems like it tells you, you know? So it always seems to tell me. But, like, but one of the features is I have kids. You, you may have kids. Um, and, I, you know, I'm not, I mean, I'm old, but I, I mean, my kids say I'm old. Um, I'm 40. So, like, I'm about ready to have a teenager next month. So these memories pop up of like our first kid. And you go, man, that was fast. I don't get that back. So I'll just have another one. Start, no, no, no. <laughs> um, this is what I'm trying to say. Pastor Joe and I got to go over to Johnny Workman's house on Tuesday. I'll never forget this moment. I walk into this home that he and his family have lived in for decades. He was born here in 1952, started his business in the 70s. He's like an, an OGGB boy. Does that make sense? Original gangster, Gulf Breeze boy. That's who this guy is. He's there, and he can barely speak. Pastor Joe said, Joe, or he said, Johnny, how are you? I'll never forget this. The look on this man's face, he says, I'm happy. I'm happy. Man, that's not for sale. That's something the Lord gives at the end of life. Life goes by so fast. If you're not careful, you can spend your life wishing upon a star when you could be living for the one who made it. Like, focus on where you are. If you or I are always pining and planning for the future, a possession, a relationship, you will miss out on what God wants to do in the moment. I think Lennon had some wisdom. Life is what happens while you're making plans, the kind of thing. But here's the principle. Philippians chapter 4, verse 18 through 20. Here's what, listen to Paul's heart. He says, I have all and I abound as he's in prison awaiting his death. What? I'm full as he's probably starving because they didn't provide for your meals in that time. You had to have your family and friends be the one that brought you sustenance in the prison system. I'm full. Having received from Epaphroditus the thing sent from you, a sweet swelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Look at verse 19. And my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Wishes. How do you beat Harry, right? If Marv was worried, what do you do with Harry? Here it is. Listen. God is my supplier. He knows what I need. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from him. John chapter 19, verse 10, when Jesus is having a discussion, a conversation with Pilate, Pilate is so perplexed by Jesus' silence before his crucifixion, and he says, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you or the power to release you? And in verse 11, Jesus says something so insightful. You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. What you have, your positions, your possessions, your people, they're a gift. They're a gift. Psalm 24.1 says, The earth is the Lord in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. So what's the point, Neil? I don't get this. This is the point. It's more of a question, I guess. I guess it's almost like I'm a politician, but here's how I would respond with a question. Who really is your God? Who or what do you look to? If God is God, He knows your needs. Look to Him and trust Him. See, Paul wasn't complacent in his contentment. Read Philippians chapters 3 and 4. He said, I've learned the secret of contentment. doesn't mean Bob Marley all day on the beach. Because in that same tone, he said, but I work harder than all of them. 
He had this settled soul. He said, God knows me. He's providing for me. I can trust him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. But in all your ways, acknowledge him. and He will direct your path. Wishes. Let God be the God of your wishes and your wants. You know why? Because like it says there in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, He will supply according to your needs, according to His riches and glory. I'll just be honest with you. God's got a lot of stuff. He's got lots of riches. He can supply for you in a moment that which you could spend a lifetime trying to build through grit. He can. The more important thing is the attitude of your heart. I love this promise from Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. God is going to supply all of your needs. How is he going to do that? With his resources, and catch this, in his timing. You remember this illustration of the drone? That you and I can live like drones, just kind of going through life, wondering what in the world, how is this all going to work out? And then God sees it from that drone perspective. He sees what you really need. If you're navigating trial, frustration, hardship, setback, it may be the very thing that God's using in your life to draw you closer to Him. Trust Him. God is a good Father. That's what Christmas is all about. He so loved the world that He gave His Son. He's not holding back from you. He's seeking to develop you through something. So trust Him. Trust Him. Trust Him. See, here's the the title for our time together this morning as we close. Joy is a gift that is given. He's given it to you. Because of what His Spirit has birthed in you. Read Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. It's also a command. But remember this morning how I said we would learn problems and principles and promises. Well, we've done that. But I love the power of being a believer in Christ. You say, what do you mean by that? Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ, who, through him who strengthens me. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. It's Christ in me, that's my hope of glory. See, the life of a believer is not about like, okay, here's my principles and promises for today, I'm going to go for it. No. The power To live a life that does reflect these principles and promises is only found in a personal relationship with Jesus. It's Christ doing this work in you and through you. How do I I tap into that? Listen to the words of Jesus, Matthew chapter 28. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus came, Advent, past, 2,000 years ago, as a Savior to die your death so that you could live his life. That's why we celebrate Christmas. And Jesus has come. Joy to the world. Jesus is coming again. Let me just ask by a show of hands. How many of you guys are thankful that one day every wrong will be made right? That's worth celebrating. Like the past Advent, man, Jesus has come. The future Advent, Jesus is coming again. The Advent right now is a life of goodness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit, Romans 14, 17. Joy is a gift that is given. Don't let it go. How can you let it go? Worries and wishes are two thieves that are always coming for you. Always. I really believe God's word is given to us so that we can learn how to live well. And these principles from God's word this morning on prayer, on perspective, on really how the power comes through a personal relationship with Jesus. Let me share something with you, and this is where we'll end this. You're accountable to those. 
You have them now. God's word communicates to you, man, when worry and wishes come, what do I do? I just freak out. That's what I know to do as a Christian. No, man. You were here on, what is it, December 12th? God has given you his word. And listen, there's no like A apostles and B apostles, like, oh, there's the A team. They just always get it. No, we're all in the same team here. Listen, worry and wishes are coming for you, but let me see your eyes. By the power of God's spirit in you, you're okay. You can do this. You can pray. Specifically. Eagerly. Thankfully. Honestly. You can do that. You can trust God when worries come. And then you can think accurately and you can take action. This isn't just for those that have the right last name. Or that are wearing the right jacket. No. This is available to all of us. A life of goodness and joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. But listen to me. God is the the master gentleman. He is not going to force his will upon you and how you respond to worries and wishes. He gives you principles. He gives you promises. He gives you the power of, of the Holy Spirit. But like Pop told us every day, we don't call him Pop, my kids do. Every day, God has a plan for you. And so does the enemy. And every day, you make choices of which plan to follow. So choose wisely. The end result of God's plan is good. Is it always easy? No, it's hard. But it's good for you. The plans of the enemy are always the sugar-coated poison apple. It looked good at first. It sounded good. even smelled good. And it was a bummer. God loves you. A relationship with Jesus is the power to live a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And because of Christmas, we have joy. Jesus has come. He's coming again. And in the here and now, He wants to lead you to a place of safety from those thieves of worries and wishes. My hope and my prayer for you as a pastor is simply this. Why would I spend time navigating this text with you on a Sunday morning. I really want you to do well in life. That's my goal. That you would learn God's word so that you can live the life that he has for you that's unlike any other life that's ever existed well. That you can run your race. That as you navigate things that are challenging, you're equipped with the tools to say, I know what God wants me to do. Not only can I put that mask on me when the plane's going down, but I can help others. God has so much goodness planned for your life. He loves you. He sent his son for you. Don't let worry and wishes thieve from you anymore. Follow the word of God by the power of the spirit of God. Because the life of a believer, Romans 14, 17, It's a lifestyle of goodness and peace and joy. How many of you guys, that sounds like, that's a good life. That's what I'm going for. Yes. Stick and stay with Jesus. Be in the community of Christians where they can encourage you because you're not designed to do this alone, but in community.